So there's Pythagoras' theorem. And uh, you know, in, the, in its usual form, a squared plus b squared is c squared. Uh, and my question to you uh, is, do you think that's what it says in Euclid? a squared plus b squared is c squared. There you go. I need, and I need answers. What do people think? What does Euclid think Pythagoras' theorem is? Probably more verbose than that. No, yeah, I mean, it is, it is more verbose. Uh, uh, sum of two squares is, sum of the areas of two squares is the third one. Aha, uh -huh, yeah. So, I mean, what is A, right? A, a is the length. And uh, we just kind of, the length squared is the area, right? But uh, actually, Euclid, Euclid, there's no equation in Euclid. You're absolutely right. There's no A. There's no lengths at all. The sides are not labelled. And Euclid just says this, in right-angled triangles, you know, the square on the hypotenuse equals the sum of the squares on the sides containing the right angle, the other two sides. So it's not a squared plus b squared is c squared, it's a plus b equals c in Euclid. So, you know, that's sort of funny because everyone says Pythagoras' theorem is a squared plus b squared is c squared. Uh, and now when you think about what, you know, what is this, if you think about what it says, it says in right angle, it says the square on the hypotenuse equals the sum of the squares on the sides contained in the right angle. But clearly this big green square is not actually literally equal uh, to you know, the union of that yellow square and that red square. So by, by equals, you know, what does he mean, right? What does Euclid mean by equal? What, yeah, what are, does anyone have a comment? What does Euclid mean? Because these clearly one square is not equal to two squares. So what exactly is equal? I remember he proves it something along the lines of scissors conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, 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 proves, he proves it by chopping up certain, he proves that essentially chops the squares up into pieces and rearranges the pieces to form the big square. You see, so he's not saying that abstractly two, two squares is equal to one square. He's saying something else, right? I mean, he means, he means they've got the same what? With the scissors construction. Area? Yeah, he means they've got yeah. the same area. So what's Euclid's definition of area? That's the question. So it turns out that Euclid does not define area in book one. And so he's claiming that one square has got the same area as two other squares, but he never defines area, okay? He just chops up the squares, and he chops up the small squares and makes the big square. That's essentially what he does. I mean, he never defines angle and he uses it from the very first part of the book. He, de he never defines angle, but he, he knows exactly what he means by angles being equal. And it's just the same with area. He never defines area, but he does say what he means by two areas being equal, which is kind of funny uh, because you would imagine you would somehow define area first and then, you know. So this concept of equal, you see, you, you, like we imagine, what does it mean for two things to be equal? It sort of means they're literally exactly the same. But when you read the statement, right? He says, the, he says, he doesn't say the area of the square equals some other area. He literally says the square equals these two other squares. So equality is not quite what you might think it, what you might think it is here. So let's have a look at what Euclid says about equality, right? Because somehow he doesn't say anything about area, but he must say something about equality. And it might not be the kind of equality we're expecting, okay? So, for those of you that have read Euclid, you cultured people, I would recommend it actually, it's quite good. Uh, before he starts on his proof, before he plows through these 47 propositions in Euclid book one, he starts off by saying what the rules are, right? And uh, amongst, among, he, he gives a lot of definitions, uh, and then he writes down five postulates and five common notions, okay? This is, this is what's in Euclid book one, before he starts on the, on the proving. Uh, and let me, you know, I want to pull out a couple of these things. Common notion four uh, is that things which coincide with one another equal one another, right? This is using Euclid's notion of equal, where we've just seen that one square 
could equal two squares, right? Things which coincide with one another equal one another, okay? So in modern language, we might say that, right? If, if x is a thing, then x equals x, okay? So that's one of, you, that's one of the axioms uh, in, Euclid's, in Euclid's elements. Uh, and common notion one, which is really good. I, I try, my father-in-law is an ex, uh, my father-in-law did classics at, uh, at Oxford. And so I've been grilling him with you know, questions about the ancient Greek. Uh, my father-in-law is clearly not a mathematician because he couldn't tell the difference between common notion four and common notion one. So common notion one says that things which equal the same thing also equal one another. So I reckon that that says if X, Y, and Z are things, okay, and X, X and Y are two things which equal the same thing Z, so if X equals Z, and if y equals z, uh, then we can conclude from that that x equals y. And you see, Euclid's been really clever here. Euclid has thought really, really carefully. Euclid is a good logician. Euclid has thought really, really carefully about exactly what is being used in his proof. Uh, it is proof that one square equals two other squares. And he's, well, Path has raised his hand. Is that intentional? Feel free, just yell. Yeah, so question. I mean, could, could it be the case that in common notion for he's the word coincide is being used literally in that he chops up the two squares and then makes the two outlines coincide and then he says they're equal yeah and that I, could be the sense aha uh -huh. he wants maybe he can make them coincide by chopping them up he, he took other common notions about he says uh, one of the common notions i think common notion two is the equals added to equals are equal so there it's kind of clearly a case of if you've got two pieces You've got one piece that equals another piece and another piece that equals another piece. You put them together, they're still equal. So he's, he's, he's thinking about things in a jigsaw kind of way. But I interpreted coincide as, as meaning x equals x. You, you might be right. I, um, I asked my father-in-law a lot of questions about equals. I didn't ask him anything about coincide. Uh, but anyway, what, may, you know, so who knows? Maybe this is my own interpretation, right? I just read this book for the first time last year. So where is, this, where, you know, where is this going? We've got x equals x, and we've got if x equals z and y equals z, then x equals y. So what have we nearly got here? And what's somehow missing? And what are we, and what, is, what is this beginning to look like? Uh, equivalence relation. Yeah, isn't it just an equivalence relation? But unfortunately, y equals z is the wrong way around, right? It should say if x equals z and z equals y, then x equals y. So there's something funny going on and we don't know, you know, we're missing an axiom, right? Uh, but this is what I was grilling my father-in-law about. Euclid doesn't use equal uh, as, a, as a predicate on unordered pairs, right? That's, his po that's one of the postulates. All right angles are equal, right? So there's a massive set of right angles and he's applying the predicate of being equal to that set, right? U Euclid is, for us, when we talk about equality, we sort of say A equals B. So for Euclid, equality isn't a predicate on ordered pairs of elements. It's just a predicate on sets. Like every, you know, he's got a set of stuff and he says, oh, everything in that set is equal. You know, that's how he's thinking uh, about this word he uses for equality, right? So that's, that seems to be how Euclid is using this concept of equality. And sets are extensional objects. Have you, have you, have you, what does that mean? Sets are extensional objects. They satisfy the axiom of extensionality. That's a, that's a very fancy way of saying a fundamental fact about sets that you, that you might well have been told. What is, what is the, yeah, go on, sorry. They're determined by their elements. Yeah, that's right. If two sets are equal, they've obviously got the same elements. But if two sets have got the same elements, then they're not obviously equal because at this point when you're building mathematics you've just got things called sets and things called elements and it's just an abstract binary relation you say this set is an element of this set and so just abstractly you know no set could be an element of any other set at all that would be sort of a you know a, a valid model for set theory before you started throwing in the axioms so two sets are equal if and only if they have the same elements uh, you know half of that is obvious but the other half is set extensionality Two things are the same if they kind of do the same things. And the only thing you could do in set theory is be an element of something else, you know, or have elements. 
It's quite, in, it's quite interesting. Mathematicians believe in functional extensionality and computer scientists don't believe in it. I think extensionality is one area. I, I've, I've been learning, I've been hanging out with computer scientists a lot recently. And uh, computer scientists don't believe in extensionality of functions. To a mathematician, how do you check the two functions are equal? You just check that if you, you know, give them the same input, then you get the same output, right? That's what it means for two functions to be equal. But to a computer scientist, like you talk to a computer scientist about the kind of sorting algorithms, and uh, you know, lots, there's lots and lots of sorting algorithms, and you can analyze their runtime and you know, see which one's better on a certain class of element. But you know, to a mathematician, if you think about it, a sorting algorithm is just a function that gives you a bunch of things that might not be in order, and it returns the things in order, right? So all sorting functions are equal if you believe in extensionality of functions. So extensionality is a sort of a funny thing that uh, not everyone believes in. But uh, two sets are equal if and only if they're made from the same things, right? So there's two sets, you know, the set X, the singleton set X union the singleton set Y. That's probably the definition of the set X comma Y. And the singleton set Y union the singleton set X. Now those are equal. Union is a commutative operator. Those two sets are equal because one's got X then Y and the other one's got Y then X. But the, the whole, the way sets work, is that you can't, uh, you, can't tell, you can't tell them apart uh, if they've got the same elements, even if they were made in different ways. As long as they ended up with the same elements, they're equal. So that's how Euclid is using this word equal. He applies it to sets, like all the elements in the set X, Y are equal. You see, so that's not, it's not entirely clear whether he means X equals Y or Y equals X, right? You know, this equality symbol came, you know, after Euclid. So Euclid can't tell the difference between x equals y and y equals x because his, you know, his syntactic, you know, he's using this concept of equality in a different way. So he just says, you know, all, you, these things in this set are equal, right? That's, that's what Euclid does. So there we go. Euclid applies this predicate of being equal to unordered pairs uh, in, in, the, in common notions one and four. And so here's our conclusion. So if x, if x, you know, x equals x, that's one of his axioms for equality. Another axiom, which is implicit in the very use of the word, equality is only used for unordered pairs, not ordered pairs. So x equals y implies y equals x, because Euclid just says the thi those, those things are equal, right? He can't tell the difference between x equals y and y equals x. He doesn't use it in the middle of, of, a, of a pair of things like that. And then finally, so that allows us to switch uh, y equals z around to z equals y. So x equals z and z equals y implies x equals y. So those are all there in Euclid. So we wrote down the axioms for an equivalence relation, but interestingly enough, uh, the equivalence relation he was considering was something he was calling equality, which is a very, you know, there's, it's, it's interesting to try and understand the difference between an equivalence relation and an equality. And that's really what the talk is about. Uh, so Euclid really, if you think about it, Euclid is talking about squares being equal. You know, if, if you like, he has two shapes, right? One is the square on the hypotenuse, and one is the union of those two other squares on the other two sides. And he's putting an equivalence relation on the set of all shapes in the plane. And he's calling that equivalence relation being equal. Okay. But you know, maybe a better way, now we, we have the notion of area, you see, so we could call it you know, having the same area. But Euclid doesn't have a definition of area. He's doing, yeah, he's doing, uh, he's doing uh, cutting things with scissors and, and rearranging them. Uh, so, and what's nice is that he manages to prove the Pythagorean theorem without ever defining area. He proves that the two areas are equal because, you know, other of his, you know, he has other common notions that says equals added to equals are equal and equals subtracted from equals are equal. So it's kind of, you know, a much earlier, I think proposition 37, uh, is that triangles with the same base and the same height are equal. And you kind of, you know, you kind of say, well, how do you think Euclid proved that? Is that obviously he's going to use the formula, right? Area is half base times height, but he doesn't have area. He doesn't have half base. You know, he never multiplies numbers together in book one. It's completely geometric. And he proves that triangles with the same base and the same height are equal by doing a very clever jigsaw puzzle. It's a really good exercise. Go ahead and try and prove that two triangles with the same base and the same height are equal by chopping one up into finitely many pieces and, 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 and arranging the other one. Or, you know, or is that really what he does? You know, or does he actually, I don't know, it's, it's, it's worth thinking about. Try and, prove, try and prove Proposition 37 of Euclid uh, without ever mentioning numbers or area or multiplication. 
try and prove that two triangles with the same base and the same height are equal, i.e. Like have the same area. So if Euclid had known about, remember Euclid can't do Cartesian coordinates because they were invented by Descartes, right? Which is 1500 years later. But if he had known about Cartesian coordinates and if he'd done the measure theory and integration course, then he would have been able to define area because it's just an integral, right? That's all an area is. And so once he'd done all that, then things would have been much easier, right? Because then he would have been able to talk about numbers. He would have been able to relate you know, area to a number. So he didn't have that. So what Euclid did have, he had a set of shapes. Okay, that's what he was talking about. You know, he's, he's defined this concept of shapes that somehow in his definitions, he's, de he's talked about points and lines, you know, and kind of two-dimensional two -dimensional regions. So he has a set of shapes. And what he doesn't have is the set of areas of those shapes. You see, because he, he hasn't defined, you know, the air, we think of the area of a shape as a number, but actually in some sense it isn't a number, right? Because Euclid never fit, you know, he doesn't have a scale. You know, what are the units? And he doesn't ever say, oh, this has got length one, because he doesn't, he doesn't talk about numbers at all, you see. For him, you know, in some sense, the length of the side and the area of the square on that side are somehow unrelated. I mean, later on, it's much later on when he, he starts... You know, he, he kind of highlights, he, he decides that an area, a length should be called units. And the moment you have that, then you can see some relationship uh, between areas and numbers. And, and he develops, you know, it's, it's interesting, he develops the theory. Uh, you can see him slowly somehow inventing the concept of, of area being a number, but he somehow never quite gets there. So Euclid didn't have the concept of, of you know, the definition of the area of a shape. And he certainly didn't, wasn't thinking of it as a number. He was doing number when he was doing number theory, but you know that was sort of integers and positive integers and positive rationals. But we have we have the notion of area, so we can think about this. Uh, we can think about this as you know, there's a function, right? There's a function from the set of shapes uh, to the set of areas, the set of areas of shapes. There's a surjective function, and uh, so you know we don't have to do what Euclid did, axiomatize equality, say the same area. We can just define a binary relation. Because we have, you see, Euclid couldn't do this because he didn't have A. We've got A, so we can just define a binary relation on our set S of shapes. By we could say that X is related to Y if and only if F of X equals F of Y. Right? Two, two, shapes are, two shapes are related. Two shapes are equal, as Euclid called it. We, could, we should maybe say two shapes are related if they have the same area. You see? Uh, and then the theorem is that uh, everything just went... Am I still there? Did somebody tell me you can hear me because things just went a bit weird. Uh, at my yes, mind. okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so the theorem is that, uh, so this has got nothing to do with shapes and areas anymore, right? Just imagine you've got two sets, S and A, you've got a, certain, you've got a function F from S to A. So now we could just define a binary relation on that set S by X is, X is related to Y, if and only if F of X equals F of Y. So now I claim that I claim that that binary relation is an equivalence relation, and that's just really obvious, okay? It just follows immediately from the fact that equality is an equivalence relation. Now, this is your mathematical equality, equality of numbers or whatever. Uh, this is easily checked to be an equivalence relation because um, equality is an equivalence relation, and equivalence relations pull back along maps. So this is an easy theorem. So here's a more interesting theorem, is that all equivalence relations on a set arise in this way. Uh, this, this picture I've shown you here, I've got a set and a surjection from a set to another set and a relation on the first set by two things are related if they become equal in the second set. So what do I mean, what do I mean by this tricky theorem? Let me, let me just state it precisely. If S is any set at all and I've got any equivalence relation on that set, okay, then I claim that there must actually exist a set A, a set of areas, uh, and a surjection F from S to A such that the two the two, two things in S are related if and only if they have the same image uh, under the map to A. So this is much harder to prove than the original theorem. It's like the converse of the original theorem. And the reason it's harder to prove is because in the original theorem, we had a set S and a set A. Uh, but in this theorem, we just have S and we have an equivalence relation. And I'm claiming that there's a set A and a surjection from S to A uh, with this property. So your proof is going to involve having to build a set A. So what's the proof? If no one can prove it, we're stuck here. That's the end of the talk. Um, can we just 
just take the set of equivalence classes? Very good. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, here's the set of equivalence classes. And this is, the, this is why equivalence classes are so important. Because they, they, they are the, the, the set of equivalence classes is the co concrete construction you need. This is the fundamental, this is a fundamental thing. It's the quotient, right? You can build it explicitly as the set of equivalence classes. And it's called the quotient of S by the equivalence relation. And there's an obvious map from the set to the equivalence classes that sends you know, an element to its equivalence class. And it's this fundamental theorem that two, two elements of S are in the same equivalence, you know, they've got, they're in the same equivalence class if and only if they're equivalent. So yes, thank you very much. Uh, well done. So that's why equivalence classes are so important. And in fact, this is, this is a way of thinking about equivalence relations that it's only really dawned on me in the last few years. And I've been in algebraic number theories for 25 years. An equivalence relation on a set, there's a, there's a way of thinking about it. And it's the way that Euclid was thinking about it, right? To, the idea is that the way you should think about equivalence relations is that two elements of a set are equivalent if they become equal when we only consider certain aspects of that element. If we, if we consider certain features of the element, for example, their size. You see, re remember this was easy, right? I, I claim that if two things are equivalent, if and only if they're the same size, I claim that's obviously an equivalence relation. And then the converse is that all equivalence relations are born that way. So this is, yeah, in, in Imperial, I lecture the introduction to, I lecture like Imre's, you know, the analog of Imre's course. And, and the example of equivalence relations I always give, I have these plastic triangles, I've probably got some around it, I've got loads of these plastic triangles that I sort of bring in. And the equivalence relation I always give is, you know, the same colour. Two plastic triangles are equivalent if they're the same colour. Uh, and, and then the equivalence classes are just like, you know, all the things of the same colour. And it's all obvious that the equivalence classes partition the shapes because every, because every, um, because every triangle has got exactly one colour. So there it's sort of interesting because the equivalence classes, you know, you could think abstractly of the equivalence classes as being equivalence classes, but also you could think of A as the set of colours when you're mapping a, you're ma mapping a plastic triangle to its colour. Uh, so here's another example, like two, nat two natural numbers, when are they congruent mod 10? That means their difference is a multiple of 10. So that's if and only if they end in the same digit. I used to give quite a convoluted proof that being congruent mod n was an equivalence relation. But if you think about it this way, two natural numbers are congruent mod 10 if and only if they end in the same digit, if and only if some aspect of them is the same, their last digit. So being congruent mod 10 is obviously an equivalence relation. One and minus one are not uh, I, I, that, that Minus one, unfortunately, is not a natural number. You see, we, can't, we could argue all day about whether zero is a natural number, but negative one for sure is not. So as I say, I learned this way about thinking about things because I've been forced to think very carefully about equality and equivalence relations because I've been using, I've been doing my mathematics in a computer proof checker uh, called Lean. And it's actually changed the way I, I think about mathematics. It's, it's made it much more precise. So let's talk about the rational numbers, right? Because actually, if you're going to build, if you're going to build, a, you know, what we're doing in, in Lean is we're building mathematics from, a, from nothing, right? We're building mathematics from a foundational axiomatic system. So let's say, you know, we, we've got as far as building the integers and we haven't, and we haven't yet built the rationals yet. Because this actually happens, right? This is what happens. First of all, you build the naturals. I mean, in, in ZFC set theory, you build it using an axiom. In Lean's dependent type theory, you build it using the Peano axioms. Uh, and then you build the integers using the naturals. And now the question is, how do we make the rationals? Uh, so the, you kind of, well, we, we know what the rationals are. The point is we've just got to tell this computer what they are. We've got to define the rationals officially so that Lean knows what the rationals are. And you know, a, a rational has a numerator and a denominator, right? Uh, and the denominator for sure is non-zero. So let's define the rationals to be, I don't know, pairs n comma d, right? Uh, so let's define it to be the set integers cross integers minus zero. Okay, and the idea is that the pair n comma d, n and d integers and d non-zero, that's going to correspond to the rational number n over d. So of course this doesn't work, right? Why doesn't this, why is that not a good definition of the rationals? Gotcha. Two, four, and four, eight are yeah, the exactly. same number. Two, four, two, four, and four, eight, and one, two as well. Yeah, the problem, the problem is we've got too many. We've got, we've got all the rationals, but we've got them too many times. 
you can't literally say the rationals are equals z cross z minus zero. Uh, so you see the pairs are different, but the rationals are equal. But for sure, there's a surjection, right? So because if we have a, you know, a numerator n and a non-zero denominator d, then we can make a rational, and every single rational could be written as numerator over denominator. So it's interesting here, what have we got here? We've got a set that we've made already, because we've made the integers, and we can make products, and we can remove zero. We've got a set, we try, we've got a mystery set we're trying to make, the set rationals, uh, and so we're in the same situation as Euclid, right? Euclid didn't have, if Euclid, Euclid could have defined areas, right? He could have defined areas, he said, take all shapes, and then, and then let's say, let's imagine, you know, if Euclid had said equivalence classes, he could have defined areas to be the set of equivalence classes of shapes under the equivalence relation of being, you know, it being e what he called equal, having the same area. So we can do this the same here. If we've got a surge etchum from a set we know to a set we, we, have, we don't know yet, we're trying to make it. So this is great. So we know what we need to do. We need to come up with the equivalence relation, right? So here we go. We're building mathematics in a theorem prover. We've built the integers. We've defined the integers. We haven't defined the rationals yet. Okay, we need to define the rationals. So in our brains, we imagine that, you know, there's a set we can make, integers cross non-zero integers. Uh, we can imagine in our brains that suggestion because we have a mental model of the rationals already, right? The idea is how do we explain this model to a computer? So there's the map sending the pair n comma d to the fraction n over d. And so now let's define an equivalence relation on the pairs. Let's say n1 d1 is equivalent to n2 d2 if and only if n1 over d1 equals n2 over d2. And now let's define the rationals to be the equivalence classes. So are you happy with that definition? There's, there's a subtle issue with that definition. That someone has to tell me. It quotes itself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. It says n1 over d1 is n2 over d2, and that's equality of rationals, right? So we're kind of pretending that n1 over d1 makes sense when we're defining the equivalence relation. Fortunately, we can get around it. So yeah, the, the, the definition of the equivalence relation assumes we know what the rationals are already, so we can't define the rationals to be the equivalence classes. However, we can restate that equality right? n1 over d1 equals n2 over d2. That's equivalent to n1 times d2 is n2 times d1 by clearing denominators. d1 and d2 are non-zero, remember. And that only needs multiplication of the integers. So this, this is good. We can have z cross z minus zero. We can put an equivalence relation on it using this property here. n1 d1 is related to n2 d2 if and only if n1 d2 is n2 d1. We can then do a bit of algebra in the integers to prove that it's an equivalence relation. Uh, and then we have, and then we can define the rationals to be the equivalence classes. And, and that's, you know, that's the way that this thing is done in mathematics. So, you know, that's sort of interesting. Is, yeah, I, I built, I got into lean in 2017 and it didn't even have the complex numbers at that time, but it did have the real numbers. So my first contribution to lean's maths library was defining the complex numbers to be the set of ordered pairs of real numbers. That was my first contribution. Uh, so, okay, so now I want to talk about Grothendieck. So Grothendieck uh, revolutionized algebraic geometry in the 1960s uh, by inventing or discovering, depending on your point of view, schemes. Uh, and I'm not gonna, you know, this isn't gonna become a graduate algebraic geometry class. Uh, so this was in the 1960s, but he made crucial use of some uh, you know, modern theory of commutative algebra, which had been developed in the 1930s and 40s by people like Emil Artin and Emmy Nerther. Uh, but one of the things he needed was a generalization of this way we built the rationals from the integers. Uh, we built the rationals from the integers by saying any integer can be a numerator and any non-zero integer can be a denominator. But Grothendieck was doing something rather more delicate, where he wasn't happy with the idea that anything uh, it, anything could be a denominator. He was only, he, he wanted to be more careful and just kind of only allow some things to be denominators. Uh, and it turns out that this abstract idea, so we're going to do a bit of ring theory, uh, but the idea is that, that, you know, modern ring theory was developed 
you know, around around 90 years ago by uh, by these people. Emmy Nerther deserves more press. You know, she rev she she paved the way for Grothendieck. Uh, so a ring, I don't really want to go into. You know, if you're a first year, you might not have seen rings. I don't know, but a ring just has a zero and a one, and you can add stuff and you can subtract stuff and you can multiply stuff. And there's no mention of division. So add subtraction and multiply. And then there's axioms, things like addition is associative and multiplication is associative. I'm not going to go in. I'm not going to go into all the axioms. It's, it's, you know, here's some examples. Here's some examples of rings there. So the last few, Q, R and C, they're things called fields. And you might have seen fields if you've done vector spaces. Fields you can divide by anything non-zero. Uh, but the rings like Z, you know, the ring of integers, you can't do division, right? Two is an integer, three is an integer, but two over three is not an integer. Even though three is non-zero, you can't divide by it. But that's okay because rings, rings don't have division. Okay, as long as you can do addition, subtraction, and multiplication, you're fine. And what Grothendieck realized was well, he, he wanted a principled way to allow certain divisions. So, so here's, here's an example of something that Grothendieck needed to do. But fortunately, you know, Artin and Nerther had done it for him. We're going to start with the integers. And now we, we've got some number like 37, and we do want to allow division by 37. But we don't, we don't want to allow division by everything, okay? We want to take sort of the smallest possible, the smallest possible subset of the rationals, which contains all the integers, and given any number in there, we can divide that number by 37, and it still stays in our set. So here you go, here's the question then. So, what, so that's what the notation is, Z1 over 37. So and the idea is that that's going to be a ring, so it's going to be closed under addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Uh, and it has to, and it has to contain one over thirty-seven. Okay, so what do you think? What do you think that ring is going to be? I'm not asking you to formally develop a theory of localization in ring theory. I'm just saying, <clears throat> what's the smallest ring? Yeah, you know, what's the smallest subset of the rationals that contains the integers and the number one over thirty-seven, and is closed under addition, subtraction, and multiplication? So which Ooh. rationals are in it? Sorry, go on. All the denominators are a power of 37. Yeah, very good. 37 is prime, so actually that's a particularly easy case. Z1 over 37 is all the rationals which A over B in lowest terms, such that the denominator is a power of 37. You can't just have the denominator is either 1 or 37 because you, it, you've got to be close under multiplication, so you have to have 1 over 37 squared there. And it's very naturally a subset of the rationals, right? Uh, but actually, we can just, but you see, what, what these, you know, algebraists in the 1930s have noticed is that actually you don't need to, you know, let's say we haven't built the rationals yet, and let's say we want to develop a theory of localization, we can abstractly build it again, just like we built, just like we built the rationals. So our numerator is, is the set Z, and our denominators now, we're just going to allow powers of 37. Okay, so that's our big set. That set's too big because it contains everything twice. Right? That big set contains 1, 1, and it also contains 37, 37, which are distinct elements of that product set. So now let's, let's take a quotient of that set, right? Let's, let's put the equivalence relation on it. Let's say n1, d1 is related to n2, d2, if and only if, you know, I want to say n1 over d1 equals n2 over d2, but, you know, we can't presuppose our thing exists yet. So we'll say if n1 times d2 is n2 times d1. And a very pleasant exercise. You can check that this is an equivalence relation. And we can define z1 over 37 as being the equivalence classes. Oh, I didn't say that. It's supposed to now say, you know, define z1 over 37 to be the quotient of that set. Oh, I do say that. It's the quotient of that set by the equivalence relation. OK, so right, no big deal. OK, and that's great. And as I say, that, that theory existed for taking, in fact, taking an arbitrary commutative ring and taking an arbitrary set of elements of that ring. And then, and then you look at all the, all the products of elements of that set. You look at the monoid generated by those elements. And then you do exactly this, this construction. Uh, but I don't want to talk about general rings or whatever. I, I, let, uh, this, this is a bit of a challenge. Let's see who's on the ball. Uh, let's, what happens if you invert four? And what happens if you invert eight? What do you think? Which rationals are in those sets? Yeah, when, a rational in lowest terms. When is it in Z1 over 4 and when is it in Z1 over 8? Uh, the denominator will be powers of 2. 
Ah, very good. You're supposed to say the denominators are powers of four, but that's no good because like two over one, denominator of power of four, one over four, denominator of power of four, product is two over four. In lowest terms is one over two, denominator is not a power of four anymore. You know, you're back to Cambridge and talking to Cambridge audiences. Yeah, very good. So Z1 over four contains one over four plus one over four is one over two. And so if it contains one over two, then it contains one over two to the n, right? Contains all the products of uh, powers of two. I, I left Cambridge because I got very bored with it as a town. Uh, that's, that's why I came out from Cambridge. I was, a, yeah, I was there for a long time. Uh, but eventually I decided I wanted to live in London and I was, you know, I decided I was just going to make my own research group. Uh, so, so Z1 over four uh, contains all the, all the rational numbers whose denominator is a power of two. And of course that's the same as Z1 over eight, right? Just the same trick. Z1 over eight it definitely contains one over eight. So it contains four over eight, which is one over two. So those two things are equal, right? Is, that, is everyone happy with that idea, right? Is anybody not happy with the idea that all of those rings are equal? <clears throat> because like, when, you know, they're all subsets of the rationals, right? And two subsets of the rationals are equal if and only if they have the same elements. And these, you know, I'm not tricking you, those, those subsets of the rationals have definitely all got the same elements, right? Okay, if they're regarded as subsets of the rationals. But actually, what if you're doing the, the theory of localization in lean and you haven't got the rationals kick it. You haven't made the rationals yet, right? You don't need the rationals to make the theory of localization. I showed you how to do it with equivalence relations. So what if actually Z1 over four is defined to be the equivalence classes in that set there, and Z1 over eight is defined to be the equivalence classes in there. You know, we put that equivalence relation on that basically means you know, that the pairs are equivalent if their if they're fractions are the same. There. If Z1 over 4 is the equivalence classes in that set, and Z1 over 8 is the equivalence classes in that set, right? And that's how, that's how you know, this thing is defined in full generality. Then let's look at those sets, right? That's what, that's what half is. If you, you know, 2 over 4, 2 over 4 equals 8 over 16 equals 32 over 64, right? All the fractions are equal. So all the pairs are equivalent. And uh, that's the set of equivalence classes that make up a half. So in Z1 over 4, a half is some random infinite collection of pairs of integers. And in Z1 over eight, a half is a kind of a related, but not exactly the same set of pairs of integers. Okay, so they're not, they haven't got the same half, right? So if you think of them abstractly as quotients, then they're not equal anymore. Because the, cla the claim is that, you know, they both contain, you know, they both contain the same a half, but they don't contain the same a half. You know, they're sort of, they're sort of weird things, right? There's a map, from Z1 over four to Z1 over eight, and there's a map from Z1 over eight to Z1 over four, but it's not the identity map. It kind of screws things around a little bit. It's sort of quite interesting what it does. It's actually quite difficult to write down what the map is in some sense. So these, these, these rings are not equal, right? But they are somehow, they're equal when you consider them as subsets of Q, but they're not equal when you consider them abstractly as, as quotients of a set by an equivalence relation. So, okay, but like big deal. So let's just consider them as subsets of Q. Yeah, 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 but wait, 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 wait. Grothendieck wasn't just doing things over the integers. Grothendieck was developing a massive theory over all commutative rings. So Grothendieck was including rings like the integers mod 10. And this ring is a really weird ring, right? The, the integers are a subset of a field, okay? And if, you know, if you've got a field around, then everything's great. You can do division by anything non-zero and things are perfect. But Z mod 10 Z, uh, doesn't can never embed into a field. A field you can do division, but there's no number system where you can do division. I mean, if one doesn't equal zero, then two times five can't be zero, because then we could divide both sides by two and deduce that five is zero. Then we divide both sides by five and deduce that one equals zero. So as long as one isn't zero, which is one of the axioms for a field, uh, then you can't have two times five is zero. But yet in that ring there, uh, two times five is zero. So there's no big underlying field where we can do our constructions. So we have to do this process of inverting elements by doing it abstractly uh, using this product construction and equivalence relations. So when Grothendieck works in this generality, if he decides to invert S squared and S cubed, uh, where S is an element of a general ring R, then those two sets there are not actually equal 
because the one of the axioms of Dennis set theory is two sets are equal if they have the same elements and these do not have the same elements right we've just seen an explicit example where it fails and of course it just fails in general so that's kind of interesting even though there's obviously a map you know there are maps between them right one over s squared is in r1 over s cubed because it's s times one over s cubed right and one over one over s cubed is in r1 over s squared because you take one over s squared you square it you multiply it by s right these rings are actually, there's maps between them, but if you actually look at what they're made from, they're made from different elements. So how are they related? Well, let's go see what Grothendieck says. So here's EGA1. Uh, this is part of Grothendieck's work. And it's all in French and it's much more complicated. So it says A is a commutative ring, M is an A module. He's working in much more generality. M is, he's working, uh, an A module is a vector space over A. I was just doing the case where A was the integers and M was A as well. Uh, and at the, at the, the conclusion he comes up with here, this M, so F, F is four and G is eight. And uh, this, lo, this notation M lower F is just like M and then invert F. And he says that they're equal. And the reason he says that they're equal is because he's happy to, he, he says that we can, identify them canonically, right? And I don't really know the history of the word canonical in the literature, but Grothendieck says it's okay, they're not equal, but we can identify them canonically. And then he uses this symbol, equality, uh, to, you see, this is not ZFC set theory equality, right? This is, this is something different. It's a different kind of equality. Just like Euclid's equality was not equals in the sense that they're the same subset of R squared, Grothendieck's equality is not normal equality either. He says they're canonically identified. And he uses the notation equals to mean canonically identified. And then, of course, because he, you know, because he was a genius, and people would really like this idea, because they could see that in examples where they worked out, like Z1 over 4 and Z1 over 8, they really were equal as long as you believed that they were subsets of the rationals. It, so even when they weren't, you could kind of see it was a good idea. But unfortunately, in lean and indeed in mathematics, right, a fundamental property of equality is if you have anything, any statement at all that you can make about stuff, that you can make about numbers, say whatever. Let's say C of X is a statement about the number X, right? A true false statement. And let's say we've got two numbers A and B and A equals B then I claim that if C of A is true, then C of B is true, right? That's called the substitution property for equality. And more generally, if C of X is just a set that you can associate to X, and if A equals B, then C of A equals C of B. And you use this all the time when you're doing mathematics. It's, you substitute in, right? Whenever you substitute in, you're using the fact that if A equals B, then anything you can do to A, you can do to B, and you'll get the same thing, right? So here we can kind of see that they're not equal because here's a statement, two over four is an element of a half, right? That's a statement about, about a half in Z1 over four, and two over four is not in a half in Z1 over eight. So this is, these are two statements you can make about Z1, Z1 over four and Z1 over eight, right? Here's a, statement about, here's a statement about things. Let's say this thing contains a half and that, and that half thing contains two comma four, okay? That statement is true for Z1 over 4, it's false for Z1 over 8, and therefore Z1 over 4 and Z1 over 8 can't be equal because you can't sub in. Right? Could, they not be equal? Could they not be of different types? Because you've said that two things have to be the same type in um, order to be equal. Right, but unfortunately they're both sets. Uh, yeah, sorry, I have a more fundamental question here. Like, when you say 2, 4 belong to half, yeah. what actually mean? Like, is half a set or is it... Yeah, it is, because it's an equivalence. I've defined Z1 over 4. If you define it the way Grothendieck defines it, then it's, then it's an element of the quotient. So it's an equivalence class. So, so half is a class, and then... It's an equivalence class, and it contains 2, 4, yeah. And half is also a class in Z1 over 8, and it doesn't contain 2, 2, 2, 4. Because 4 isn't even valid, right? A half is a subset of the following set. It's the product of the integers and the powers of 4. So two comma four is in, it's back here, right? I, I explicitly wrote them down, there we go. You see that half, right? Ah, okay, fine. That, that half is an equivalence class. Okay. And the other half is a different equivalence class. It's a subset of a different set. Does that um, not just mean that your type system is not sufficiently specific? 
if all sets are of the same type. Surely Z1 over 4 and Z1 over 8 should be different types because you can't add something from one to the other. I mean, I mean if you think of them as subsets, yeah, I don't know. It's sort of, I mean, if I've, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have written type theory. Let, let's talk about this in terms of ZFC set theory. You agree that they're both sets, right? Oh, so I'm just a computer on, scientist on, nitpicking uh -huh. over the definition of type. Okay, great. So let's, th th I'm talking to mathematicians, and mathematicians don't even know <laughs> what a type is. So let, I, I should have said, let, let me change this. Hang on. Uh, uh, is, the, is, the, is the property of elements, uh, you know, of, of, of sets, of sets x. I'm fixing it uh, there. And if a equals b are two sets, uh, there we go. Uh, right, there. So let's say c of x is a property of sets, okay? And if a and b are two sets and they're equal, and if c of a is true, then c of b is true, okay? And now ask any set theorist uh, whether equality has the substitution property in set theory, and they'll tell you it is, right? And ask any set theorist what mathematics is, and they'll say it's set theory, right? Because that was the point of set theory. It was designed so you could build mathematics on top. So we have a problem here. Hello, Path. Yeah. Wait, so, wouldn't, so if you're using the equal, equality by canonical isomorphism for Z1 over 4 and Z1 over 8, yeah. wouldn't it be unfair to use traditional equality for the two halves. So I could like, I could use half and half prime and say they are equal in the same sense of the canonical isomorphism. Oh, and then but by C, A, A and B are Z1 over four and Z1 over eight. And C, C of X is the property, C, C of X is the property, X contains a half and a half contains two comma four. So it's Z1 over four and Z1 over eight. This is sort of a funny thing. I mean, you're right, right? Something funny is going on, okay? Hmm. Something funny is going on, but I know better examples. Uh, um, so where, I have a question here. Um, instead of, so if C is any property of sets, but yeah. why, uh, what if you could just like not allow you having properties of sets? Yeah, yeah, that would be good. Allow properties yeah. of rings. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. As your you somehow, because C's. somehow this is a bit weird, right? Half isn't supposed to have elements at all, right? If you ask Gauss or Euler whether half had any elements, they'd be like, no, half's a number, right? Numbers that have elements. This is the problem of making mathematics in set, set theory, right? In set theory, everything's a set. So the real numbers are a set, that's fine. The real numbers have got elements like pi, that's fine. Pi is a set, that's not really fine. You know, Gauss and Euler did not think that pi was a set. If you make the real numbers, it's equivalent to classes of Cauchy sequences, then pi really is a set, right? Pi contains elements like, you know, infinite sequences of rationals, which, you know, three, 3.1, 3.14, 3.141, dot, dot, dot. So there's something a bit weird is going on here because we're, we're sort of asking weird things about numbers that we shouldn't be asking. So yeah, somehow we shouldn't allow all properties, but in set theory, they allow all properties. And it's also true in type theory. So this is somehow a, fu a fundamental problem, right? You decide to use a theorem prover and the theorem prover has this substitution property and it's, and it's true for all properties that you can make sense of in your system. So you run into this when you're trying to type Grothendieck into, into one of these systems is that sometimes he uses equals when he doesn't mean equals. And it started in the 70s. This is Milne's book on it. The, I learned a tile cohomology from a book by Milne. And uh, Milne's book on a tile cohomology, he adopts this thing here. There's, he's, this, is, this is in the conventions page at the beginning. And this, you know, this phrase canonical isomorphism is now embedded, it's now embedded in the culture. Uh, a canonical isomorphism is denoted by equality. So every time you see the word equals in this book, it might not mean that the sets are equal. It might mean that the sets are somehow canonically isomorphic. So it becomes really important to figure out what canonical isomorphism is, right? So let's look it up on Wikipedia. Okay, let's find a definitive answer. What does, it, what, what does Wikipedia say? You know, what, is it, what does Wikipedia say about this, this quote of Grothendieck from, S, from EGA? You know, Grothendieck won the Fields Medal for, you know, for, for all this work. He, you know, his work went on and proved the Vay conjectures. You know, it's kind of a big deal. So Wikipedia says that a canonical isomorphism is a canonical map which happens to be an isomorphism, which is kind of fair enough. So then you have to say, what's a canonical map? And Wikipedia has got, handily, it's got an entire page on canonical maps. So here's Wikipedia's page on canonical maps. Uh, if you're following this talk on your phone, you probably can't read this. So let me read it to you. A canonical map, it says, is a map between objects 
that arises naturally from the definition or the construction of the objects. Uh, okay, whatever that means. In general, it's the map which preserves the widest amount of structure. Uh, okay, and it tends to be unique. Okay, uh, but might not be. I know examples where it isn't. Class field theory. In the rare cases where latitude and choices remains, uh, the map is either conventionally agreed upon to be the most useful for further analysis or sometimes the most elegant map known up to date. So there you go, a canonical map between two things is the most elegant map that you can come across. A, a great example uh, is a map. Uh, there's a map from a vector space to its double dual, if you know about that. You send V to the function that sends phi uh, to phi of V. It, it, it's a very elegant definition. There's another perfectly good uh, canonical isomorphism. Well, it's an isomorphism. It, it would send v to the map sending phi to minus phi of v. This is also an isomorphism. And it also satisfies, it was also a natural isomorphism in the sense of category theory. It's also a natural transformation. But somehow, because there's a minus sign in, it's apparently not elegant. Or maybe there's a convention. Like, what the, if you want to type maths into a theorem prover, like, what does that even mean, right? This is, this is, this is not mathematics, right? That's not a proper definition. That's sort of waffle, right? You, you, can't, you can't actually type that into a theorem prover. So in my opinion, that really shouldn't be called mathematics. If you're a formalist, uh, you should not regard that thing as being mathematics. So, okay, I'm wrapping up. Voivodsky, I, as you can see, I've only got a couple of pages left. I'm not gonna go on for another half an hour. I can see I'm over time, but I started late. Uh, so Voivodsky oh, thought- Sorry, we started like 10 minutes late, so you, you have an as a 10 minutes. Okay, so we've got time for questions. So Voivodsky's proposal, uh, he says, why don't we forget about canonical isomorphism because we don't really know what it means, but we do know what isomorphism means. So let's say, let's say two objects are equal if they're isomorphic. So this is really quite a radical, uh, really quite a radical idea. So the, univa the univalence axiom says that the set of isomorphisms between X and Y is isomorphic to the, to the set of proofs of equality of X equals Y. So this, this has got a big, in my opinion, this, there's a big issue here, right? So Wojtowski designed a theorem prover which weren't like this. I mean, he wrote it on top of the Koch theorem prover, but he added, he added a univalence axiom to this thing here. And unfortunately, he has this problem. Uh, there's the problem that this, this univalence axiom actually breaks uh, this, you know, this substitution principle of equality. So Wolwodzki said, okay, you can use this theorem prover, but there's certain, there's certain functions that you're not allowed to use if you write code uh, for my extension of this theorem prover. So it's a rather unsatisfactory system in some sense. And the other problem is, of course, things can be isomorphic in lots of ways. And so as a consequence, in Wolwodzki's system, uh, things can become equal in lots of ways. So we have two proofs that X equals Y. They might not be the same proof. And when, you, and when you apply this substitution principle, uh, the proof kind of goes with it. And eventually you kind of think, okay, so now I should have proved that these two things are equal. Uh, you know, you think you've proved that two equals two, but unfortunately one of the proofs use some intermediate objects X and Y, which were proved equal by proof one. And the other one proved that they were equal by proof two. So these two twos aren't actually quite equal. Uh, so I've never really used a system, but I, I think the idea of having things being equal in more than one way, I'm very uncomfortable with that idea. Whereas I'm very happy with the idea that things can be isomorphic in more than one way. Uh, this, this shows up all the time, you know, the real numbers, you know, as a, as, a, you know, as a set or as a topological space or as a metric space, the real numbers are isomorphic to themselves by, you know, you just send X to X plus one. The complex numbers are isomorphic to themselves in two ways, right? The identity function, is an isomorphism for the complexes of the complexes. And complex conjugation is another one. It preserves addition, it preserves multiplication. I'm very happy that things can be isomorphic to themselves in more than one way, but I'm a little bit unhappy about things being equal to each other in more than one way. So, you know, there's something you can do. You can go and investigate what Wojtowski did. Uh, and of course, you know, the, Wojtowski has a fan club, right? There's, there's people that think he was doing a great thing. And he's got a fields medal like Grothen did. Uh, but he got his fields medal for doing algebraic geometry, uh, not, not for doing this stuff. Uh, and unfortunately, Wojtowski's axiom can be, you can disprove it in Lean, right? Lean has a perfectly good system uh, which can do all of classical mathematics, but you can disprove this because one of the axioms of Lean is that things can only be equal in one way, which to me as a mathematician, that's my model of equality. If I've got two proofs that x equals y, 
then somehow there must be the same proof. There's, you know, x equals y is just a, a true false statement. So if you proved it, then it's true. You know, it's all different. You know, what, what's the difference between truth and proof? You know, truth and proof. Uh, it's sort of a funny thing. So here are the conclusions. Then we've got conclusions. Then we've got adverts. Right. The conclusions is that if you if you're happy uh, to regard canonically isomorphic objects as equal, then you can actually cheat in maths. And when we were typing in Grothendieck's work into the Lean Theorem Prover, uh, we we actually found uh, we actually found issues where Grothendieck would do this. He said, oh, these two rings are equal, even though actually when you look at the definitions really carefully, they're not actually equal. He says these two rings are equal, and therefore some other things are equal. Uh, and you can't make that deduction with this dodgy notion of equal. But actually, uh, somebody said this earlier, why don't we restrict the class of proposition C, which we'll allow to, to apply this axiom for. So Grothendieck applied this without ever sort of saying anything about his his C's, his function C, which he was using it for. But every time he did it, we checked that it was okay. We checked that C was in a certain restricted class of true false statements, where it was true that if these things were, you know, canonically isomorphic, whatever that means, you know, in the example where Grothendieck was using it, if you had these two localizations of rings, then every time he pretended they were equal and applied the substitution principle, it was a valid piece of mathematics. Although sometimes it needed justification. And Grothendieck never justified it because to him it was intuitively obvious. So this is a question, you know, what was Grothendieck's model of mathematics? Uh, and does it really coincide with the Lean Theorem Proofers model? I mean, it's my, I don't think it does quite. So here's an open problem. You know, this would be a great way of fixing it. That, that rubbish page on Wikipedia, actually tell me what canonically isomorphic means, right? Tell me what Grothendieck is actually talking about by giving me a definition of canonically isomorphic, which is actually mathematics. You know, it has a, a formal definition. And if you could do that, then that's great, because then I can type it into lead, and then I can make a tactic uh, which, which applies this, you know, this modified substitution principle. Uh, and then I'll be able to formalize Grothendieck much more easily, because that's one of the things I'm doing at the minute. You know, I'm, I'm typing in work of Grothendieck. You know, the idea is we want to get, we want to get uh, you know, artificial intelligence to start being as good at algebraic geometry as Grothendieck, but the first thing you've got to do is train it. So you have to train it on, uh, you know, you have to train it on Grothendieck. And we, we're now beginning to learn, you know, we've developed tactics uh, which will do this kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, but we're, we're, always, we're always kind of skirting around the question of what it means for two things. It's, what, it's like pornography. Like, it's difficult to define, but you know it when you see it, right? So we know that these rings are supposed to be canonically isomorphic. And so that's exactly, you know, we have specific tactics that, you know, that work in this canonical isomorphism sense. And I'll tell you something, if your lecturers ever use it, if your lecturers ever write down a map and say that this map is canonical, you should absolutely challenge them. Because, I, you know, I claim that there, there are some cases when lecturers use this word where it doesn't actually make sense. Uh, and so I'll finish with an ad. So if you, if you like thinking about mathematics in this very precise way, and you, know, you like the idea that mathematics is a game, and, uh, and you know, things have rather beautiful and concise definitions, and you can build everything up from that, then you might actually really like doing mathematics in Lean. Uh, I started it in 2017, and it's completely changed my life. I used to play a lot of Zelda you know, in my spare time, and now I do Lean in my spare time, and it turns out I'm actually being more productive because it's part of my research. Uh, so, you know, lean, sort of the, the, the first time I used it, I learned lean by doing a bunch of undergraduate problem sheets, by doing, by doing basically, you know, by, by formalizing the problem sheets in my introduction to proof calls. So, like, take in raised numbers and set scores. Shing has done this already, Shing Tak Lan. He formalized a bunch of the questions and the numbers and set scores. You take the question, you turn it into a computer puzzle game, and then you solve that level, and, you know, it's kind of cool. And, and on the way, you might assume that one is e not equal to two, and he's like, well, you know, can you supply a proof of that, please? And you have to know what you're doing, right? How do you prove that from first principles? One's not equal to two. I mean, there's a one-line proof in Lean that uses a tactic. But actually, go and think about it. Think about the real numbers, one and two. Think about the definition of real numbers as equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences. And prove, you know, and then think about what one means and then prove to me that one is not equal to two. This is somehow a much more complicated question than you realise, really. Uh, so why should you do lean? I just, I, there are four undergraduates in Imperial that are going to get a publication. You know, I, I formalise schemes with a bunch of first years and they're going to have a publication by the time they graduate. 
uh, and that's kind of cool. Uh, and do you know what? There's still some undergraduate maths left. I personally have been working, I've been doing work of Schultzer recently. Peter Schultzer, you know, challenged my community, challenged the lean community to formalize one of his theorems for, for lots of reasons. He wrote a blog, you can read on my blog post why he did it. Uh, so I'm kind of working with, so I'm doing serious research level mathematics in the system now, is now sufficiently mature. But do you know what? There's still some undergraduate maths we didn't do. Uh, and if you're interested in getting a publication of your own, maybe you want to just pick some of this stuff off. Uh, so I actually, I'm teaching a course uh, for mathematician lean beginners. It's a course for PhD students, uh, but actually uh, we run it on the Discord. So anyone can come really, as long as they've got an invite to my Discord. It's on Thursdays. You've missed, what well, first lecture was uh, yesterday. Uh, yeah, we started at about 4.15. I start at four o'clock using Teams and I switch to Discord. But if you, if you want to come along, I'll post an invite in the chat and I'll post, I'll show you what we missed. Uh, but if you really, if you, if, you, if you think of this as a computer game, the Discord might be the place for you. But if you actually want to, you know, consider doing some undergraduate research, uh, then there's the Lean Zulip chat. You know, Peter Schultz hangs out there, Fields medalists hang out there, undergraduates hang out there. But everyone would treat each other with respect. You know, everyone uses real names, and it's a research environment. It's an amazing place. Uh, is, say we have world experts. We have the guy that wrote Lean hangs out there, and we have Fields medalists hanging out there. You know, two Fields medalists have got logins there. Uh, so that's it, really. That's it for the talk. Uh, I am now going to post some. I'm going to post some links in the chat if anyone's interested. Uh, but the 73. I haven't been looking at the chat at all. I will look at the chat now, but that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. I'm happy to have them. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the really interesting talk.